Hi, good afternoon, Roy Oppenheim here. It's, it's really hard to believe that this is our eighth Zoom at noon, um, going back eight weeks to the, to the days of March when we were literally um, bailing out of our, our, our office. Um, this concept was really just something that we thought we, we would do and try, and, and because of you all, because of the support we've gotten from the community, we're now into week eight. You know, some days uh, seem like it's Groundhog Day, but, but for us, the Zooms at noon, and maybe for you too, provides a demarcation in the week, so it isn't like every day is a, is a, is a blur day, but you know, Zoom at noon is on Tuesdays at noon, and, and it's going to keep going until uh, you all don't show up. And frankly, one of the things I'd like you all to answer today is what you would like us to talk about in the future, and you can just send that through the questions uh, portal. But more importantly, this is an interactive process. I can't do it without you all. So the most important thing is if you have questions as we're speaking to, to let us know what those questions are, or if you have a comment, or if you think we're dead wrong, that's okay too, because you're entitled to your opinion and that's what the First Amendment is, is all about. So first of all, I, I wanna thank those who, who have made this possible. Of course, Lance Oppenheim, our son, who's been handling uh, the, the whole production of this, and then uh, pa Paolo Vergara, who's been helping with, with putting uh, all the content together. And then of course my partner is Ellen, who's also my wife, and, and Jeff Sherman, uh, both of whom have been instrumental in, in supporting this, this, this venture. Um, the firm, as you know, is, is over 30 years old. We've been in the area of real estate and we were at, at ground zero for the foreclosure crisis uh, just 10 or 12 years ago. And, and still it just, we find it mind numbing that, that we're back in a situation that, that uh, has us look back at that as almost as a, a dry run for, for what we are going to be dealing with, with here. I, of course, want to also thank Ken Morris, who is joining us today, and I'll properly introduce him in, in, in a few minutes. Ken's a good friend and has been participating in all these uh, uh, Zooms at noons, and, and more importantly, he's a, a very, very astute uh, commercial real estate broker who uh, will be able to give us a, a tremendous context of, of what's going on in, in the community. Uh, so let's, let's proceed. Real estate, the top five, borders shut, horizons of, of hope. Um, Let's talk about that with, with weekly unemployment update. Then we'll talk about pandemic scenarios. Then we'll go into the, the five different uh, areas of, of real estate, residential, commercial properties, office space, hotels, Florida number one destination in, 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 the, in the country, maybe the world right now, and then uh, what our top five uh, takeaways are going to be from, from this presentation. At, as, I, as I mentioned, our firm was founded literally in 1989 by Ellen and, and myself. Actually, Ellen founded the firm first. We have well over 75 years of collective legal experience, and we've been helping folks during this whole crisis, uh, particularly in the area of real estate in terms of their mortgages, the PPP, uh, in terms of getting out of leases, representing landlords and trying to deal with their tenants, and of course, people who are, who are trying to figure out how to pay their mortgages or how to stay afloat or whether they should apply for unemployment or should apply for the PPP. We're here as, as a resource to the community like we were last time, and we thank you all for, for giving us that, that sense of purpose in this, in this crazy year. Uh, our team, as I mentioned, is myself and, and Ellen, my partner, and my wife, and Jeff Sherman, Paula, and, and Mia Singh, uh, uh, my senior associate. And let me introduce you all now to Ken Morris, if I may. Ken has over 30 years of, of experience as a broker. He is uh, the owner of Morris Southeast Group. I also knew his father very, very well. Uh, he, they are a full commercial real estate firm. Uh, Ken holds a prestigious uh, title of Society of Industrial Office Realtors and, and the Real Property Administrator's designation. Ken is an industry expert covering South Florida commercial real estate and is just really a knowledgeable thought leader uh, in the community. And um, most, most importantly, I like to think of Ken as a, as a really close friend and, and confidant. Next slide. Um, you know, uh, I found that someone sent this to me on, on Facebook last night. I really wasn't originally part of the presentation, but it, but it really speaks to what's going on here. This is from 1962. It's a, a, a picture uh, that was in, a, in an Italian magazine, and it was just some artist's rendition of what they thought uh, 2022 was going to look like. And it's just fascinating because uh, you have people in their own little cocoons, you know, traveling in, in mass. And, and ironically, this is what we're going to be doing for the next several months, maybe next several years, where we're all going to be traveling together, yet also traveling alone. And we're also seeing there's a throwback, almost like going back to, to the future, going back to the past, as we're going to see the things that we were accustomed to when we were growing up, whether it was milk being delivered to the house, or whether it was going by a farm store and, and getting our milk, uh, that those kinds of things that, that allowed for less uh, 
touch with human interaction, but, but more service uh, is going to come back. And that's going to be, I, I think, uh, uh, our, our guiding light in terms of, of what's going to happen in, in real estate. So this picture kind of says it all, and, and I hope you uh, you think it does also. Thanks. So last time we were we were talking about estate planning. A number of you reached out to us, and uh, if we can assist you with estate planning in the future or with asset protection, uh, now is a good time to do that, especially while you're hunkered down at home and you have a chance to think about about your future. This week we're going to talk about uh, the panorama panorama of real estate as we are getting ready to, to reopen the nation or partially reopen the nation. Uh, Coca-Cola may have said it best to the human race for every border shut, there are horizons of hope. Um, obviously there has to be hope without hope, there, there's nothing. Hopefully that's one of the things that we have inspired here is to give people hope that there is gonna be a future. It's going to be different, it's gonna look different. And how do we participate? How do we thrive? Just like the, the Chinese suggest that for every crisis there's opportunity. We see this as, as both a crisis as well as an opportunity. And hopefully the reason you're joining us today is for that very reason. Let's go and look at the unemployment rates because without understanding this, it, it's kind of hard to understand where, where we're going. So uh, in, in, in January of this past year, there were only uh, 212,000 unemployment claims, which is not very much for the, for the country. And then they started to rise to 3 million, 6 million, 5 million and, and now 4 million, leading up to 30 million people who are currently unemployed. The reason it's, it's dropping is in part is because sometimes the application process is slowing and also many companies are, are, are starting to slow down on the layoffs, but, but there are still many, many tens of thousands of people being laid off by major companies every day. GE announced, I think just last night, that they're laying off 11,000 employees, so that's clearly not, not factored in. Next. GDP. This basically says, you know, is the economy growing? Is it not? If we look at 2008, we see that, that the, the GDP actually uh, uh, went down 8% uh, during uh, the, the uh, Great Recession, and it's already down for this first quarter of, uh, of close to 5%. And so now we're going to go to our first question, and that's going to be, uh, according, to 60, uh, according to 60 Minutes, how much will the economy decline in the second quarter of this year? And the question is, answer is 15%, 25%, 40%, or 50%. And uh, I guess a lot of people watch 60 Minutes. What can I tell you? Uh, hang on. OK, so a number of you are saying about 20% said 15%. Uh, most of you said 25%. A third said 40% and a few said 50%. And, and, and according to the experts uh, that 60 Minutes had interviewed, it looks like the economy this next quarter will drop 40%. Uh, then the question is what happens to the third and fourth quarter? Does it sustain itself or does it start to pick up? And I think it's too early for us to say that. But we are looking at, at, at probably something close to a 40% decline uh, in the economy uh, in this next quarter. If we get through this, we'll all be okay. Uh, Let's talk about the unemployment rate, but before that, I want, I, Warren Buffett had his annual meeting, but unfortunately it was an empty auditorium. He did it uh, via Zoom or, or some other technology, and, and he had said at the time that energy, real estate, and the retail industries are all facing problems that could reverberate through the economy and into the banking system. Well, if it reverberates into the banking system, then we all got a major problem. But, but there is a, a major suggestion here that uh, energy, as we all know, is, is, is uh, the prices have, have dropped and, and we're in a deflationary cycle there. And, and I'm, I'm concerned and it's likely that both real estate and retail will be in this deflationary cycle. Anyone who shops online, not necessarily on Amazon, but other places are seeing outrageous deals. And, and, uh, um, and that suggests also the, the deflationary cycle. Real estate, it has not yet happened. And then only certain segments of the real estate market, which Ken will talk about, will probably be more deflationary than other. It all really ends up having to do with employment and, and, and how quickly the economy is growing. Without the consumer, uh, all these things start to collapse. And so right now, uh, we're seeing that um, uh, back in the 1930s, unemployment had hit close to 25%. It's estimated right now that it's 13%, which leads us to our second question, and that is, uh, what do you think the unemployment rate will be during the crisis, during, well, excuse me, let me repeat that. What do you think the unemployment rate will hit during the economic crisis? It's multiple choice, 15, 20, 25, or 30%. Well, some people are saying 15%. I'm afraid that will probably not be right. 20% maybe, 25% a quarter, 30% are saying 
uh, 30% and 6% saying don't know. I, I think most people are saying it's going to be 20 to 30%, probably 25 is probably going to be the answer. We really don't know yet how this is all going to shake out, but it's probably going to approach or exceed the unemployment rate of the Great Depression. And that, and that is one thing that, that I think most people are now conceding will happen. The, the only question will be for how long this will occur and will it be short-lived because of all the economic incentives that the government is creating by pouring billions, I mean trillions of dollars into the economy. Uh, I want to go over the different pandemic scenarios because that will suggest how long unemployment will be high, how long the GDP will, will not be in, in, in full throttle, and, and we're not sure which of these scenarios will pan out, but it's important for all of us to understand what these possibilities are. The first scenario is that there'll be a first wave to last until spring 2020. Uh, then there'll be consecutive, small, repetitive waves until 2021. And then the virus would, virus would diminish sometime in, in 2021. There would still be periodic um, excuse me, lost the slide there. There still will be uh, still periodic shutdowns and subsequent relaxation of mitigating measures for two years. So that's scenario number one. Now we'll go to scenario number two. The first wave of spring 2020, there'll be a larger wave in winter 2020. That larger wave could be a function also of the general virus season and, and doctors not being able to distinguish between the virus, a, 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 re a regular flu virus and, and, and the uh, uh, coronavirus, and then there would be smaller waves in 2021. This this was the behavior of the Spanish flu in, in 1918. There were actually three waves. I always thought there were two, but there were actually three, and uh, th it was devastating because of the, the second larger wave due to the adverse impact of the of, of the healthcare and the entire economy. Uh, again, we're not sure what will happen. And then there's the third scenario. Although I think there's a question actually, isn't there? Right? Okay. Uh, what's the next question, if we would? Okay. Uh, End of crisis and progress. How long do you think it will take for the economy to stabilize? Multiple choice, six months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, or unsure? Okay, a few people say six months, a number of you say 12 months, the bulk of you are saying 18 months, uh, some are saying unsure, which is always a, a, the right answer here, but 24, uh, 24 months is what a lot of people are saying. Boy, well. and, and I think if you ask most experts, you'll hear 18 to 24 months, I'm starting to hear some other experts say that it could be three years, but, but no one really knows. Obviously, it's going to be a function of, of two things. If we're going to get palliative care so that the virus is, is no longer as deadly, and of course, the, the other aspect is how long it will take to develop a safe virus, a, a safe vaccine that can be distributed to the community, and how long it will take to manufacture the vaccine once, it, once it's available. Okay. Uh, I think I'm going to see if Ken Morris is available. Ken, are you there, buddy? Hang on one second. I am here. Great. I, what, what I'd like to do is, is go through with you, if you may. First of all, I'd like to introduce yourself properly. Here, here's Ken. Uh, it's good to see you. Great to see you, and thank you for the opportunity to participate. I've enjoyed every single one of your Zoom at noon meetings, and the information is uh, un, unparalleled. And uh, this is really strategic information to help us all make better decisions. So thank you for that and this opportunity. So it's great to see you. You want to comment on that we, that we just ran through or you just want to keep going? Well, you know, I, at, uh, it's probably going to be somewhere in, in between. I think as the state, um, it's going to, there's going to be an in, in cases. And I think the real question mark is whether or not there's going to be uh, a shutdown again. What we're all trying to avoid is 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 going back into quarantine mode, uh, but it's unsure how that's going to be. We do need to get the economy restarted. Uh, unfortunately, there are there is a vulnerable population, and much America doesn't really have a a, a great uh, track record as far as taking care of themselves. You know, as far as diabetes and and other health conditions, and I think that's going to have an impact. So I'm leaning towards this is going to be with us for the next. 18 to 24 months at a minimum. And I think we need to be prepared for that. And hopefully I'm wrong. Well, let's hope we're all wrong. That would be the uh, let, Let's go on and talk about residential real estate a little bit, because I know there are a lot of folks who uh, are in that business at, at, at different components. I mean, we are in terms of lawyers and, and title companies, but there are a lot of realtors on the phone. Uh, this is their bread and butter. They've been doing this for 30 years. And so let's, let's give them some sense of, of what's going to be going on in, in this particular market if we can. 
Well, you know, right now in New York City and other major cities, uh, there happens to be a, a sort of a groundswell of cancel the rent and a lot of activism related to that. Unfortunately, while I understand the pressure points that all of those tenants are feeling, this is fundamental to how our country operates, right? A contract is a contract. Um, you know, I think the government is going to have to step in and help many of these local landlords. And right now, much of the uh, support that the government's been providing to small business has left out the smaller landlord and the landlord community. Uh, this is a problem that's going to continue. Uh, the short-term nature of the PPP is really, it was designed for three months and it's sort of missing most of the people that it's supposed to take care of including the small local landlords of which millions and you can't make the rent go away. You can't do a rent strike because you know, when is a contract, not a contract. It's very important that we understand that a lot of people are suffering, but we have to figure out to it, not paying your rent, not talking to your landlord is really not a solution. Right. No, you're, we've recommended that everyone work with their landlord and try and figure stuff out if you can't pay the rent. And also, you know, there are some people who are trying to take advantage of the situation. But but I think, you know, there's so many people who are unemployed right now that, that, that the landlords need to work with them and, and just not do anything silly, because what's the likelihood that they're going to find a new tenant anyway, right? Right now, no. And, and most of the court systems are shut down around the country. So even if you wanted to get rid of a tenant that's not paying, whether it's a residential tenant or a commercial tenant, there's a lot you can do. And yeah, there will be some, some cases of people taking advantage of it. There always is. And this is just new news. The, 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 the South Florida courts have, have announced that, that uh, and I don't know if it's a state, but certainly South Florida, that the, uh, they will remain closed for uh, in-person activity through the July 4th weekend. Um, and that, and it, before it was, I think, the end of May, and they've just extended it now. Uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't hearings going on because we, we we're doing, a, you know, the Zoom type hearings uh, every day. But but in person evidentiary hearings, trials of that nature are are not going to occur now through through July fourth. So that means uh, there will be limitations on on what what uh, the court system can actually do during during this period of time. Uh, I, I want to go to the, the next question if I can, Ken. Uh, and that is, do you think suburbia will be the big winner during this crisis? The answer is yes or no. Before you answer, let's see what everyone else says. I think our questions are getting, our, our questions are getting a bit too easy because everyone seems to be getting the, the answers or maybe we're, we're just repeating ourselves and, and it, we're in a, some sort of <laughs> but 64 percent of the of, of the folks on the phone today are, are suggesting that suburbia is going to be the big winner here in terms of of, of, of residential so why don't you speak on to that if you could please yeah it, it is and, and you know it's so strange how things you know come back around in a circle right you know 20 years ago they were saying that suburbia was dead people didn't want to get in their cars and drive um they were in Suburbs and nobody wanted to buy houses. Now it's really a function of of density, and if you can afford to get out of the big cities and get into a less intense, less dense environment like the suburbs, you're going to do it. And that's just from a health and safety standpoint. There's also a quality of life component to it. You know, at a certain point, it's very difficult to raise a family in a very intense, dense environment. And also, the big cities are very expensive to live in. Now, given COVID and the fact that being close to another person and you cannot avoid it in heavy populated areas like New York City and Chicago, et cetera, you know, they're all trying to get out. And I think that while the millennials did not or weren't really seen as having the funds or the interest in purchasing homes, I think that has changed uh, due to COVID. And I think the burbs are going to be big winners. So I think that uh, single family home prices for purchase are going to stay relatively stable. And there's a whole new class of, of rental properties, which are single family homes, where large investors like Blackstone and other institutional investors are going in and buying and developing brand new communities that are single family homes because people wanna live in their own little enclosed space 
And I think that trend is going uh, to increase. Let, let's do uh, two things. One is, if, if you all have any questions or comments, you know, now is a good time to start, start pe peppering them. There's some people who are asking right. questions about future slides, but if we've covered anything, if you have a question, this is a good time to, to actually uh, you know, put it up there. But Ken, let, let's talk a little bit about shared appreciation ownership and, 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 and also what the impact's gonna be of rental communities that are single family, because that has changed dramatically from like 3% to over 10 or 11% in the past 10 years. Well, I, I think it's a smart play from the developer or the ownership side because you can always decide if you want a condo downstream, if the world changes, they'll have that opportunity to do that. I think it all is a function of cost, what it's going to cost to build the units, what it's going to cost for rental. You know, remember it, everything's an algorithm and it has to fit within a specific bandwidth. Um, you know, I don't know how cookie cutter those developments are going to be, but assuming there's going to be duplication and a lot of cookie cutter of that, um, you know, shared appreciation ownership is something so new that I'm not even, you know, remotely an expert on that. So I'll leave that to your uh, capable hands if you want to discuss it. I do want to go back to single family. Back to single family. I mean, one of the, the nice things that, that makes it affordable is obviously you don't need a down payment. You're not making a long-term commitment, but like your bug guy, your pool guy, and even the financing of construction is all being done on a massive scale. And so because of that, you're getting huge discounts uh, on, on the money that's needed to support the property. The cost of maintenance is, is down because it's all, it's all virtually like wholesale versus retail. It's kind of like going to Costco versus going to you know, Publix or something. You're gonna get a discount because it's all being done on, on bulk. I mean, everything's being managed on bulk, the internet's on bulk, the cable TV's on bulk. And so each step of the way, in theory, a portion of that discount should be provided to the consumer. Of course, it's always going to the developer, but at the end of the day, it, it, it should end up being a good play. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly because there'll be uh, an economy of scale over, you know, over the portfolio of several thousand units that they'll be able to make those savings. Right. So in theory, it'll still be less ex potentially less expensive to rent that single family unit rather than owning your own single family home. But again, there'll be limitations on what you're allowed to do with that unit compared to if it was your own home. And, you know, I assume it'll be more restrictive. You're not going to be able to have, you know, the pickup truck in the front yard with the hood up and, you know, lawn furniture all over the place. You, you were talking to me a little bit yesterday about how <laughs> and, 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 and uh, architects are going to redesign the family home to create more working spaces for people who are going to work and live at home. Yeah, I, uh, I've been talking with several architects and I've also been reading extensively like you have. Um, I think that's going to be a trend that's going to be paralleled in the multifamily housing sector that new units and existing units are going to be redesigned to accommodate an alcove for work. And I think core issues are bandwidth and, and the ability for people to log on and do their work because I think co remote working is, is, is here we have the technology to support it finally. And I think that genie's out of the bottle. So new units and uh, homes, instead of having dens or family rooms or, or whatever they can trade off, will have a, an area for an office or a work alcove. And that will have the technology support that it will require to be able to, to be successful. And to. I, I just want to add that a, a lot of these single family rental communities or, or even traditional ownership homes that are going to be built by, by developers are going to have super, you know, 5G internet, you know, built into the walls and, and built into the, into, into the guts of the, of the home. Agreed. Yeah. Back when, back in the, in the dark ages, uh, when I used to take a horse and buggy to get to university of Miami, one of my uh, final projects research was related on smart home technology that they were just forecast at time what it would take to wire the house completely. Now with the internet of things, it's much, much easier to have high bandwidth and basically all of these new units are all gonna be completely smart. They'll be able to manage the energy and, and water usage down to the specific faucet or appliance. There are two questions. First is, what is shared appreciation ownership? Let, let, me, let me take a stab at that. Basically, you, you may own the home, but, but you may only put a part of the down payment down. So if you have, let's say, a $100,000 down payment, the bank says, 
we're going to put 20,000 of that down payment down. That's a fifth. So not only are you going to pay the mortgage, but at the end, when you sell the house, if there's been any appreciation in the home, let's say you made a uh, hundred thousand and you put down a hundred thousand, you keep the home for 10 or 15 years, you won't keep that hundred thousand. You'll keep 80,000 of it because 20,000 of it belongs or one fifth belongs to the bank or, or the, or the financier who shared the ownership interest with you. So if you put down only a portion of your, of your initial deposit, then a portion of the ownership at the end of the day may belong to the investor uh, who co-invested with you at, or, or shared the appreciation and with you. And so uh, it's a way to get into a home with a smaller down payment, yet you don't completely own the full upsize, upside. You would, you would share that upside. One more question. Do landlords who own uh, individual rental properties in several condo buildings qualify for unemployment insurance and or the PUA benefits in Florida. Uh, I'm not sure about the PUA. I'm, I'm just not familiar with that. Maybe Ken is. I don't know what that is. Maybe there's someone else on, on, on the line who does. And in terms of are you eligible for unemployment? Un unemployment is a function of, of you being either an independent contractor uh, for federal, but not, not for Florida. Florida doesn't even recognize independent contractors, but the, the, the federal program does. But more importantly, you know, are you a W-2? Are you an employee? So unless you're paying yourself as an employee, which you're probably not, because historically that wouldn't be the, the way you would you would want to take your your income out of out of uh, being a landlord. The likelihood is that you wouldn't qualify for for unemployment, unfortunately. Uh, next page. Uh, we'll go to commercial properties if if that's okay. Uh, let's start with uh, strip malls. Ken. Yeah, um, you know, unfortunately. The COVID-19 uh, crisis and pandemic has really affected and accelerated various trends. Uh, I think well-located strip malls in areas that have a need for those services, uh, hair salons, barbershops, um, small local restaurants, they're going to be okay once we get the dust settles and people start going back out to shop. Uh, I think that the landlords now that own strip malls, they're facing a tough time. There's, you know, they're basically looking at rising vacancies and falling rents, and that's going to that's gonna be a hangover that's going to be with them for the next three to five years. It's going to take a long time for, for strip malls to, to sort of get back to where they were. Amazingly, before this event happened, the vacancy rate across South Florida for for neighborhood retail strip malls was around four and a half, five percent, which is very, very strong. But remember, most of those tenant strip malls are not big retailers. They're not. Um, you might have a T store, but you're not competing against e-commerce. Uh, I think, unfortunately, the small business people uh, are are going to be heavily impacted because it comes down to the buying power of the consumer and what's going on in the neighborhood or, or the community surrounding where that strip mall is located. I, I do want to totally, if I may mention a few things. Number one, we, uh, many of you may know that 2J is a, a well-known deli. They have a number of, uh, of places around, around South Florida uh, and, and actually up, up in the villages. Uh, they filed for bankruptcy because they haven't been able to pay their rent. And so by filing for bankruptcy, and as, as many of you know, we're, we're helping restaurants like like 2J's, but we're not representing 2J's, but other restaurants uh, in, in trying to figure out how they can uh, exist and, and, and stay in business when, when they can't pay their rent. And so there's this, this subsection five of, of the chapter 11, which is a new section, is very valuable to, to folks who are, who are strip mall tenants and need a way to figure out how to keep their lease, but not get thrown out by, by, by their landlord. But the tough part is that the PPP requires that a place like 2J's keep all their employees basically uh, working during a certain eight week period, which means that they would have to call them back to work. It, it, it's probably unlikely that they could keep them all busy if, if in fact they can't even be open in some of the places. Sure, they could do takeout, but, but still won't cover the nut. So the PPP really hasn't helped uh, restaurants to a large extent and, and also nail salons and, and beauty parlors for, for it, the it, it, Yeah, it, it was a real misfire, um, unfortunately. And those are the people that really need the help. You know, neighborhood restaurants and the nail salons and, and those other type of s small service businesses are somewhat community centers, you know, or anchors to our community and part of our daily lives and schedule. The problem with restaurants moving forward that I see is that, like, remember I said, everything's an algorithm in life. 
the formula of a restaurant is you have to have the right space, the right menu, the right team, you know, the, the right bar, the right, everything has to be perfect. And now if you're expected as a restaurateur to basically say, now I can only have 50% of my patrons come to my bar or come to my restaurant, no more people crowded, packed together, waiting for a table. Those days are, are over, at least for now. But, but there was How are you supposed to make it? I mean, I will say there was even before this crisis that, that takeout was, was going to consume 30, 40, even 50 percent of the revenue of certain restaurants. And so, so there was this trend, uh, especially with the door dashes and the grub hubs of the world, that they were actually encouraging uh, you know, people to basically eat at home and, 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 and have their stuff delivered. So that, that trend started. This has just accelerated it to such a, an, an incredible rate that some restaurants just can't transition quickly into, into just being primarily takeout. Because if you're at only 25 or 50% seating capacity, you're not gonna be making money for the people that's sitting there. You're just gonna have them hopefully come in, enjoy the meal, so they will then become a customer for takeout for the next five years. And you basically just picked up a, a, a client or customer you know, for that period. But you're not gonna make money. It'll be impossible so to make money. It becomes a showroom for your, uh, for your kitchen and your menu. That's right. So, you know, the other thing is, which, which is an issue with the unemployment, and we're seeing this in New York, where unemployment uh, payments are so high that restaurants that may want to reopen at some point won't be able to reopen really till July or August till unemployment benefits burn off because some of the chefs and other folks who are working in these restaurants are making more money on unemployment than yeah. they are if they were working. And so a lot of uh, restaurants are saying, listen, I'm not going to try and open till August because my people aren't coming back till then. So that's also an unfortunate moral hazard of, of having you know, very high unemployment uh, payments that the, that the federal government. I mean, there's some people getting 1200 bucks a, a week. And so down here, that's not gonna happen, but certainly in New York, and even in New York, some, some people who work in restaurants clearly are not making that kind of money. Anyway, let's, uh, let's move on to the, the next uh, type of property. Detached commercial properties. You know, we were looking yesterday, Paolo finds me. I said, let's find some farm store pictures from old Florida. These detached kinds of business environments, whether it's a drive-through bank, bench, bank, a drive-through McDonald's, or a Starbucks. I mean, they're able to function almost at capacity. What, what, what do you say to that, Ken? Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, it's interesting. Everything that's old becomes new again. Uh, uh, maybe I'll get a fedora like uh, those people riding around in their little uh, uh, glass box cars or, or carts. You know, it's funny because scooters are now, I, I, I love that picture, by the way, and I have to I have to get a copy of that and, and put it somewhere. Uh, but the point is, is that everything is, you know, they will come back. The issue, though, I think the limiting factor for for these little drive ups is the cost of ground and zoning, you know, considerations and circulation patterns and so forth. If it is existing product, you know, it's going to be just fine. Um, I'm not sure uh, it's so easy to put together a quarter acre piece of ground to build a little pop up for a little coffee. It may take a little, you know, right now this might be uh, a winner, but it's, uh, I'm not sure that it's got legs for long term. You know, it's funny, it's, I think about this maybe a little bit more, but like the Aventura Mall is now having drive up for many of their small retailers. And I haven't done it, but I know some people have. And so the entire mall concept of, of basically showing up, uh, you're not going in the mall, you're just driving up and each, each space is really becoming a mini warehouse. I mean, it's very expensive mini warehouse space, I understand. But, but that's kind of where, where we're moving. I, I love it because I hate shopping and I hate going to the mall. So I slow down to five miles an hour and they pitch things into my window. I'm in. So I think we're going to be looking at a lot of that. And so uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting concept. Let, let's go on to Florida industrial because I know that's one of your favorite uh, uh, areas to talk about. Let's I love industrial. Um, I, I love industrial. And yeah, supply chain networks are, are really uh, have been disrupted. And I think that's not just on locally, but a global scale. And I think the big winner of all of this and all property types, if people said, what should I invest in or what's going to survive and do okay, is really a uh, distribution warehouse. Uh, 3PL, you know, third party logistics companies are going to be booming. There's going to be uh, increased demand because of e commerce all the way across the board. You know, we're getting food delivered to us. That needs to come from a warehouse. You know, Publix has their own warehouses and then the people who pick it up have their own warehouses, refrigerator warehouses are gonna grow the demand pattern. I see, you know, millions and millions of square feet of demand. I think initially, just for the next maybe three to six months, 
pause on spec development. Like Prologis and some of the other big developers are saying, hey, let's see the dust settle a little bit. But long term, bulk distribution is, is going to continue to skyrocket. And I think that uh, bringing supply chain uh, 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 safety back to the United States is very important. Right now, supply chain is really China supply chain for a lot of our goods uh, and products. And obviously, we're going to be shifting back to the United States. I also think that there's going to be a trend uh, of an increase in additive manufacturing, right. which everybody right. knows is 3D printing. So you're going to have buildings where the product is manufactured, shipped right from the same facility. And that's coming. The new development is all going to be 36 foot clear and above. Take advantage of cubic storage. And, you know, here in South Florida, we're, we're pretty much out of ground. Uh, the developers are still trying to push out that western boundary in southwest um, Dade, really into the Everglades, which I'm not a fan of. All of that ground is being looked at for bulk distribution centers because uh, MIA is really out of room for cargo. So the last mile distribution is obviously going to be continued to increase in demand. Uh, E-commerce, you know, uh, we're all going to be buying everything online, much yeah. less so than going to the store or going yeah. to the drive-by mall where they, they throw boxes through your window. Yeah. What's the possibility of having like distribution centers that aren't just one story, but actually are multiple story and have using technology to, to bring stuff down to the ground and which would be cheaper than having, you know, these, you know, buying the ground. Well, they have it now. I mean, in, in Japan and cer certain areas uh, in Asia, they have these, you know, five story uh, warehouse buildings. And it's very interesting to see the design component of it because you have to design it for these massive, massive drive areas where you can have super large fork trucks go through in the lanes and, and how it's designed and how they get product from one place to the other and obviously down to the ground where it gets shipped away. And they also have, you know, ramps going up to this, you know, second story and third story. Very, very interesting. So you're going to see more of that. The, I guess the, the limiting factor for all of this is what the cost of construction is going to be. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we get into office, but um, bulk distribution warehouse, uh, you know, off the charts going to be great. I think manufacturing is going to change. I think the days of, Massive 300, 400,000 square foot manufacturing facilities will start to fade out when, when 3D printing really continues to take off. It's less expensive and you can run 5,000 parts instead of 5 million parts and you don't have to store it everywhere and you can see how it goes when it hits the market and sells and then you can refine it, sell another 5,000. So unfortunately, instead of having American workers working in factories, you're going to have lots of robotic 3D and robots doing a lot of the manufacturing. So I think we have to, you know, be real about what the expectations are for manufacturing coming back to the States, but it's definitely going to change. Thank you. I'm going to go to some questions, Ken, if that's okay. Can you sure. address what, what you think will happen to the new development of what used to be uh, the fashion mall, please? So what's going to happen to the fashion mall is the question. You know, what, what do you think is going to happen to the fashion mall and plantation? Well, I, I think our a smart guy uh, and very successful. He's the developer behind it. Um, I watched that property for years. I remember going to the fashion mall when it first opened. Um, and obviously those days are over. Um, they have uh, gutted the sole office building that was on site. They're hoping to lease it out for, you know, third party tenants. Um, the residential component, I think ultimately will be successful. Uh, I think it's going to take time now in this in this new climate. I think, unfortunately, the city of Plantation really made it hard to get the development up and running. But I think that that specific development will be successful, and uh, it's adding new energy and life into what was starting to become a more older part of Western Broward. A little bit further up the street is the uh, uh, headquarters for. Um, um, sorry, the, uh, I'm having a, a brain fart, okay. um, where they have the, uh, uh, augmented reality company and, 
there's all new development going on at the, the intersection of University and uh, Sunrise, which is just a couple miles north of the old Fashion Mall site. So with the new residential, the new retail that's going to be there, it's going to take time. They're really going to have, you know, it's going to take time to get those retail spaces leased up, just like they will in Dania Point, which is a brand new retail uh, project that was just completed just south of the airport of uh, that faces 95. Right. It will be successful. It's well designed, but you know, it all comes down to cash flow. Cash flow is the primary consideration. If the consumer doesn't have the money to pay their, their rent or their mortgage. They're not going to be in, uh, so excited to go out to a retail plaza. I want to go to this because it kind of uh, speaks a lot to what we're talking about. Uh, uh, lifelines for small businesses are the drive ups. I mean, I, I think we're seeing uh, whether it's going to be drive in movie theaters or it's going to be uh, people driving up to have their orders taken. I mean, I think we're, we're, we're kind of going back to the future as, as, as we both suggested here. Any, any thoughts? No, I, I think, yeah, I, I think at least for the, for the time being, I, I think that that will come back. Um, I think it'll be a novelty. Um, if I had known we were going to talk about this, I would have had my Doc Brown hair sticking straight up uh, from Back to the Future. But, um, you know, again, uh, it, it really comes down to how long the fear is going to last related to the pandemic. You know, if we get, if we wrap this up quicker and we get a, a vaccine or we get that palliative care, you know, put in place where less people have to be afraid, that's going to kind of dictate certain, you know, some of these trends. Right. I mean, but, I, mean I, I wanted to add here, I mean, the, the time that strep throat was, was, you know, could be the kiss of death before we had antibiotics. And today, right. you know, when you get strep throat, you call your doctor, you get an antibiotic, you may not even go to the doctor, and it, and it doesn't, like, cause, you know, a pandemic crisis where everyone has to shelter in place. So, I mean, I think that that could be one of the, the things that happened here that you're talking about. Okay, let's go to curbside. I mean, we talked about this, but this is just a great picture. I mean, if everything's going to go to curbside, then location, location, location becomes less significant in terms of the value of property. I mean, why go to a Publix when you could actually go to a Publix warehouse or have the Publix warehouse delivered to you? I mean, the real question is going to be, what's the value of location? Is that paradigm going to change? I, I'm smiling because I remember there was an enterprise. Uh, I forgot the name of the actor, but he was in, uh, he was Seinfeld. He played Elaine's boyfriend and he's been the spokesman for enterprise where he goes to pick up his rental car. He goes, I don't have to talk to anybody, I'm not talking to you. And he goes straight to his car and you know, he gets what he wants. And I think that's the world we're kind of, we're, we're, we've been moving in that direction. And, you know, and I think with, with apps, you'll be able to, you know, everything will be waiting for you. And uh, this is definitely here to stay, especially for restaurants. Yeah. Let's go to page in the next slide if we can. Uh, so, so here you have, you know, a, uh, a supermarket and like the supermarket is, 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 is like parts of it are becoming off limits because it's, it's being converted already in, into, a, into a quasi warehouse. And so there, there are parts of stores that you can't even be, be part of anymore, and they're just closing down more and more of it. And, and so eventually the question is, you know, why pay prime rent in a certain location when you're going to either do pickup or delivery? And so that's going to be the real question for, for uh, I, I think, the, the landlords and the, and the financiers, the mortgage companies and the institutions that provide the financing to, to, all, to all these folks for, for so many years. Let, let's go to malls, next, next page if we can. And this is this, of course, becomes a very interesting issue. Uh, what, what's your thought on on shopping malls and their viability going going forward? They're done. I mean, this pandemic event really was is just accelerating the the the, the end of the mall, uh, department stores too, for the most part, unless there's a climatic reason, like you're in northern North Dakota or, or Minnesota, and it's you know sub zero eight months out of the year, an indoor mall is something that is a necessity. But for the most part, like the old fashioned mall or the Broward mall, for the most part, they're done. Uh, they're going to have to either be de demolished or adaptive reuse entertainment. But even that, there's a limit to how many uh, laser tag centers and, and you know, uh, trampoline gyms that you can have. Uh, it just, you know, it, nobody shops like that anymore for the most part. And they're going to have to go. Uh, the good news is there's going to be a millions of square feet of real estate land that's going to open up for all sorts of other uses. Uh, maybe some of them can be converted to residential use. Um, 
hard to say. Uh, so it, so it's a case by case basis. So if that, if that were used for multifamily, and, and it could be used partially for affordable housing, and could reduce some of the, 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 the economic crises that, that we were having before this, this pandemic. It, it, it could, but you know, before the fashion mall went into, uh, before it was sold to the Chinese and then the Chinese lost it, I was uh, invited to consider taking over the leasing of the whole plaza. What they were thinking at that time was turning it into office space. And I mean, you know, I said, wow, that's an interesting idea. But just think about the transit time to get from the parking garage to any part of, you know, this mall. I, I timed it. I said, no one's going to want to walk 20 second, 20 minutes to get to wherever they want to go, whether it's an office or an apartment. The other issue is life safety considerations. Uh, you're going to have to, I mean, the plumbing, all of the cost to retrofit those, those older structures, you're probably better off just hitting the plunger and right. starting from scratch. I do want to add that the mall is only as good as its constituent uh, occupants. And so besides J. Crew announcing and True Religion filing for bankruptcy again, right. and we talked about Saks Fifth Avenue, uh, the following are at the cusp. And by the time we, we come on Zoom at noon uh, for our ninth session, a number of these companies will have announced bankruptcy. And those are Neiman Marcus, Victoria's Secrets, General Nutrition, Party City, J.C. Penny, and GameStop. Now, most of these companies were not doing particularly well before the crisis. And so this is just pushing them over the edge. And so, uh, although general nutrition probably wasn't doing that bad, but the problem is, is that you can order your stuff online from, from, from a place like general nutrition and even party city. I mean, the idea that you have to walk through those horrible aisles anyway, who really wants to do that? They're really not <laughs> that nice. Even Marcus yeah. is a different story. Um, uh, is there, is there some questions? Let, let me, let me do this, this question. When were we supposed to do this? I think we, we missed this, but oh no, it goes up under hotel. So we'll, let's keep, let's go to the next slide if we can. Uh, big venues. Let's talk about big venues. What, what's your feeling about, about big venues, you know, for physical gatherings, you know, uh, art venues, convention centers, party venues, you know, sports arenas? Um, look, uh, I like going to a baseball game. Uh, I like watching the field. It makes me feel like I'm 10 years old again. Um, I like to hear, uh, uh, you know, the crowd react, run or a strike out. Uh, I think a lot of people are social. Most people are social animals. We like to spend time with, uh, uh, you know, with with other people. Um, I, again, I think it all comes down to how quickly we get through this fear period related to the pandemic. I think it's way too early to tell whether these large venues are going to be winners or not winners. I can tell you, I'd rather sit in my family room and look at my 80 inch TV than go to a movie now. But maybe that's just because I'm getting to be a cranky middle aged guy. Uh, and I don't want to hear someone fight over the same candy wrapper for 20 minutes. And, and, uh, and, and someone just asked me a question. We, we should probably have Lance answer this, but, but what will happen regarding the entertainment in industry? Movie sets are shut down. There's no new production. I, I, I mean, I think the answer is that, that over time, this crisis will resolve itself, just like it always has in the history of, of mankind. And, and these industries will come back. They may not come back the same way exactly, uh, but... People have always been entertained. From the times of Shakespeare, there's, there's been theater, and there's going to, there was theater before Shakespeare, during the Greek and Roman times. And, and so entertainment's not going away because we all need to be entertained. I mean, that's just part of life. It's part of culture. It's part of our anthropology. It's part of our DNA. And so there will be entertainment. There will be an entertainment industry. Will it look exactly the same like it looks before the crisis? It, it can't because we will all be changed by this by by this by this event. Now, maybe in a hundred years we won't be changed because they, we won't remember. But but there will be so many institutional changes that that, that will have have occurred. And so, for example, let let's um, talk about office space. Okay, let's talk about the changes, the institutional changes that are going to be permanent in office space. Let let's talk about that. Well, um, I think it's kind of early in the game to 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 really plant our flag into really what the, the office is going to look like. But my prediction right off the bat is that at least most enterprises are going to reduce their footprints by 25% or more. Uh, remote working has been forcibly proven to, to be effective and for most people relatively efficient. I have several clients that are now considering going completely virtual uh, because it works so well for them. Now, not every business can function that way. And some do need a physical address. And I believe that most enterprises do need some location 
for the team to convene occasionally for employees to rotate in and out for training, you know, uh, get another boost of corporate culture and so forth. But I think that um, the cube farms uh, of, of the last 25, 30 years may be done. And I think we'll see a return to more individual workspaces or offices and so forth. The limiting factor for that's going to be is cost. The cost per square foot of construction has, is over double, beyond double from when I started. When I started, a decent office could be built out for around 20. Now, you can't even build a decent office uh, for you know, 55 $60 a foot. And I'm not talking about super fancy. Super fancy spaces are over $100 a foot. So it comes down to, you know, the cost shifting and who's going to, to bear that cost. Now, some of the design and some of the offices can be built with modular systems where the landlord invest or theoretically could invest in modular system walls that can be put up and put down uh, for some tenants that'll work. And it's a question of whether the landlord owns that product or the tenant owns that product. We predict that moving forward, lease terms are also going to be shorter. You know, for the last five to 10 years, there's been a push for five to seven leases. I think with accounting law changes, the FASB rule changes, and now this, um, you're going to see tenants want to sign for shorter term leases. And the problem with that is, is the cost of, building out office is so expensive the landlord to be able to underwrite that cost there has to be a longer runway in time well now the tenants are going to have to shoulder more of the burden or they're going to have to have less in the improvement space or the space will just be everybody's going to have to live with spec spaces where you take a 5,000 foot office and that's what you need yeah and offices and that's it because they're solid and they're not going to be changed or they're so modular what do you think of the WeWorks model? I mean, it seems like this is not good for WeWorks. It is not. It is not. It's not good for the co-working space. Um, you know, the, one of the things about WeWork and a co-working model was, you know, and we're social animals. And for the people that were working out of the house and feeling isolated, it gave you the opportunity to go to the coffee bar and, and talk about your widget or your web design and what they're doing and share ideas. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're the next Microsoft. That's going to change because now, and I've been in many WeWorks, they have these little phone booths. You have to touch the door to get in. It's this cramped little door full of virus all over the place. That's got to change. Now, WeWork has come out with a new model showing what it's going to look like now, but it's got people far apart from each other. It's back to like a restaurant. How is WeWork or that co-working model going to survive when you have your, your density level is reduced by half. It, it's just, it's not the same environment. There, some will survive, but some are not gonna make it. It's just, it's just not, it's not gonna make it in a post COVID world. I wanna move on, but in terms of current office space, I mean, I know that, that under the CDC, uh, offices are gonna have to create sanitation wardens, they're gonna have to hand out supplies, uh, you know, for gloves and, and, and face right. masks. I mean, it's gonna be a, a completely different environment. I mean, uh, coffee bars are gone. I mean, kitchens, <clears throat> communal kitchens are gonna be gone. I mean, I mean, really the, the whole gestalt of, of the office is going to change. Well, you're gonna have touchless services, you're gonna have doors, either automatic sensors that open up for bathrooms, touch the door handle, all of that's going to happen. And, you know, major employers now, nationwide just announced today, they're closed five major centers and all of those people are gonna be working from home. Uh, OpenTex, which is a technology company based in Ontario, Canada, just uh, announced that they are eliminating 50% of their office space forever. It's done and they're gonna be saving $75 million a year. So. Again, the footprint is going to continue to shrink, and what's left and how we office is definitely has changed. And I think you and I talked about this, but some major banks that have major bank towers are concerned about how do they get their employees up the elevator. You know, if they're like a 30, 40, 50 story tower, if only two people really should be in an elevator at one time. I mean, it just it, it becomes a logistical nightmare how that works. Right. And how do you protect yourself as an employer, right. uh, you know, from litigation? Uh, they could come in and say, I got sick 
in the elevator. I got selfish. I got wherever. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's going to be, you know, an interesting time um, and, and probably a good one for, for the legal community. Not only this, but also your litigation and business litigation. It's just a tidal wave of, of litigation. Anyway, this is, I think, our last question, uh, and it has to do with uh, hotels or a actually Airbnb. How long does Airbnb require the property owner to keep their properties vacant for disinfection purposes between rentals? 12 hours, 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours. I think I know the answer. Yeah, I fooled over half of you. Two thirds of you I fooled. Okay, so 14% 12 hours, 18% said 24, 33% 48, and 29% after I said that, I fooled you some more, said 72 hours. So 28% of you said 72 hours, and guess what it is? Three days. So after each rental, you have to keep the place dormant for three days, besides disinfecting it, just to make sure that the virus dies during those three days if you miss the surface, which means that unless you're doing long-term rentals, for 10 days or two weeks or a month, there is no model that will allow you to be an Airbnb uh, owner that, that's gonna provide you with any success. If you're doing two days and then three days off, two days on, three, I mean, maybe three days on, three days, it doesn't work, it just doesn't work. You'd have to double or triple the amount you're collecting. Now, if you're doing a month rental and then three days off, that may well work because you could amortize those three days into your months. But the, the short-term Airbnb may be gone and good for hotels because the competition of Airbnb for hotels Will go down but then the question is what do hotels do because people are going to feel more secure going to an airbnb unless hotels provide a similar type of guarantee uh let, let's talk a little bit about hotels ken and, and i know we're running out of time but it, let, let's push through this uh well look they're going to have a, a really tough time for the next three to five years i mean uh business travel is going to be way down now with video conferencing look at you know how effective zoom is microsoft meetings and all those other platforms um, and it's a budget issue. I've got a, a very close friend that is a senior director of a food, major food company, and he's on a plane, I'd say 200 days a year. And a lot of that's going to go away. And his quality of life is going to go up and their travel budget's going to go way down. Um, and uh, I don't think, uh, I think a lot of hotels are not going to make it. I think some will probably get converted to affordable housing. Um, and, uh, I think the way we check into hotels, the way we access our rooms, you know, hotel, uh, let's, let's face it, you know, every, and maybe I'm a germ phobe and I admit it, but, you know, checking into a hotel, you know, they're never really the cleanest places. I don't care whether it's a four star or five star place. You always wonder, you know, how clean are, are the sheets and how clean is the bathroom? So, you know, the cleaning protocols, like we talked about uh -huh. office, it's going to have to be absolutely uh, brought to the forefront and they're going to have to make people feel absolutely certain that this is a clean place. To stay. I, think, I think when we look at hotels, one of the things, can we go back to a second? Uh, what I want to talk about is that it, depending on how long it takes for the airline industry to recover is going to be a function of the hotels. Now, of course, a lot of people do drive, you know, to motel sixes or, or, or along the roads, but, but a lot of hotels have to do with, going on a business trip, going on a family vacation, going to sure. a convention, uh, visiting family from afar and still staying in a hotel. And you usually get on a plane or you're getting on a plane and a cruise. And so based on how those industries do, those will be uh, really good ways to, to determine how the hotel industry and the real estate market's gonna do based on, 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 on the airlines. And just so everyone knows, uh, some folks are saying it took five years uh, to recover from 9-11, other folks are saying three years, but three, three to five years, is, is what it basically took to have the airline industry recover. And so to some extent, that's how long it may take for the hotel industry to recover because they're so tied at the hip. Uh, let's move on. Okay, next. Wait, it, 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 I, I want to make one point before we go about uh, Airbnbs and the hotels, and that's, and that's the debt load on those properties. A lot of people bought properties that they really may not have been able to fully afford, but were basically doing it because they knew they would get Airbnb rentals out of it. Now they're in trouble because, you know, at least over the next several months, there's very little, if none coming in as far as income goes and their income they have to expect is going to go down regarding the, the hotels. They're going to have to go to their lenders now and have a hard heart to heart and say, you know, what are you going to be able to do for us? Otherwise, 
the lending community, the capital markets are going to be sitting on millions of square feet of empty hotel rooms with a, a you know, a 2% census. I want to move on. To By the way, you have a fan out there. Excellent, excellent, fabulous, Ken. So congratulations on that. Thanks. <laughs> um, but let's, let's just talk about Florida. I mean, it looks like it's a little early to predict exactly what's going to happen. Uh, prices so far are, are, are holding steady. A uh, number of listings uh, seem to be quite tight right now because so many people don't know what to do. So they're actually holding back. So prices haven't dropped. Unemployment is going to, of course, be critical because if you don't have enough people to support the, the real estate market, that's going to be an issue. But of course, if we go to the next slide, Florida is now going to be the number one relocation destination in the United States. It, it, it close it was almost before the crisis, and now it, it actually is. And so with the, the influx of folks from up north, from urban areas, that's going to have a major impact, I think, on supporting the, the real estate market. doesn't mean prices are going to go up, but it may mean that, that that will provide some sort of support. What do you think? I agree. Um, I think there's still a, I mean, before uh, COVID-19, there was a net increase of 1,000 people a day moving into the state. Now, not all of them were coming to South Florida. Most of them were going to be up in the Jacksonville, Orlando, Tampa, you know, areas. But still, even if we got 8 to 10% of them, that's another 30,000 cars on our streets every year. And, you know, that's obviously increases the pressure for services and a place to live. So I do think it'll, it'll help us. Plus our, our tax uh, situation here is favorable compared to being in California or New York state. So we are seeing a fair amount of migration, you know, from the Northeast. And I only think it's only going to continue. Uh, I, I think the other side of that is, you know, limiting factor will maybe climate change. And that's something we can talk about offline or, or another time. For another presentation but, uh, not today. Let, let me just mention that, that exactly. there'll be a number a number of folks who are actually going to buy their places sight unseen via via you know remote uh, showings and that and you're actually right. going to have remote online notarization and closings through through our title company and other title companies and so you're going to see a lot of, of folks who are actually not they're going to come and see their place the first time when they move in and, and there may be even opportunities for companies to, to to actually represent you not not as a realtor but to do your walkthrough for you to determine if everything's in place and the appliances are working. Of course, you could have the realtor do it, but you may want a third party to do it. So I think we're going to have new niche businesses that, that, that are going to pop up as, as part of that, that, that process. Um, I like it. Let, let's talk about the, uh, the five big ticket changes, uh, the, 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 the big takeaways here that we can talk about. And I'll let you run through them real quick, Ken. Well, um, you know, everybody says when you get in the real estate world and you own real estate, you never can get hurt. Uh, that's not true. It's never been true. Um, I think over the last five years, especially, you know, these super low cap rate deals, cap the capitalization rate, that's, you know, a, a way of what the income stream is off of the income from the property. Uh, it used to, I used to say it was capitalization rate. Now it means can't actually profit. You know, some of these very low cap rate deals, meaning high prices are now inverted because when you have a significant number of your tenants, uh, not paying the rent, there's no income stream, you're done. You've got a problem and you're going to have to figure it out. Um, big single purpose spaces, department stores, uh, they've been in trouble for a while. Um, they're going to have to be repurposed. Uh, Amazon, interestingly enough, when we were talking about groceries before, they're uh, looking at uh, uh, hurting retail and they're looking to come up with a new concept to put uh, warehouse distribution for food food service in retail so it'll basically be warehousing in retail plazas but obviously amazon is looking for a deal for that um e-commerce is here to stay it's only getting bigger it's you know it's probably going to double from what it was last year i don't see that changing i think there'll be new technology coming out it'll even affect the fashion industry you'll be able to have like you know basically a laser you know, scan you and you'll be able to pick whatever you want to have fabricated. One of those days, you know, the 3D printer will make it, but you'll, you'll be able to have on-demand clothes like you can have on-demand video that's coming. Uh, drive up services, like we said before, absolutely. Um, I think that's the one of the only ways restaurants are going to make it right now. Um, I don't know how you get your nails done drive up, but I'm sure someone will figure it out. I don't get my nails done as you can see, but um, you know, I'm sure someone will come up with that. Maybe, maybe a haircut. Cause I definitely need a haircut. I haven't okay, had one. Out. <laughs> yeah. You know, 
I, I've gotten offers. My wife refuses to do it, and I said, just stay away from my hair. I'm just fine. Um, and one, and yeah, I, I, yeah, I agree. Yeah, Single-family housing. It, it, you know, I was pretty down on single-family housing because the millennial trend and not wanting to plant roots or, or invest their money elsewhere. Um, but I think that this is definitely turning it around. Anyway, I think the biggest takeaway is if you have commercial real estate, if you're trying to downsize, upsize, reposition, you realize that Ken is a, is a thought leader and he thinks and, and he's just a, a great guy and, and I'm glad to call you a friend and, and, and a broker. And, and, and Likewise. importantly, he, he equally thinks the way we do in terms of our firm, being able to take our clients through this transition, figure out what the next step is. If you have to go up, go down, renegotiate, reposition, uh, you know, it requires a, a certain amount of thought and someone who, who's thinking a little bit outside the box and our firm, you know, has been doing this now for 30 some odd years. And, and I hope we'll be doing it for another 30 years. And I, and, and I, I wish the same for you, Ken. So, so on behalf of the entire law firm and on behalf of Ken, Ken Morris from, from, Mor from Morris Development, I, I want to thank you all so much for, for joining us today. And more importantly, if there's a particular topic that you would like us to address uh, next week, uh, please email me at, at Roy at oplaw.net, Roy at oplaw.net or use the, the portal right here and you could say, hey, why don't you talk about this next week? We'd love to hear, so, so we're talking about things that, that you all are, are interested in. Uh, Roy Oppenheim from Zoom at Noon, see you next Tuesday. Thank you very much. Have a great day and a great week and stay safe. God bless.